Epic fail, you loser. All right. Uh, thank you, Will Ferrell's the best. so good good to see you look at you brighton <laughs> brighton it looks looks sunny but maybe that's just for like the fluorescent it's all lights. fluoros boy it's all the tungsten ah oh, god <laughs> i just think it's because it's like ah, oh, it's it's like australia so australia. it must be yeah right and i was like talking to a friend before and literally the sun came out through her window and her whole she's like the whole room lit up and uh she's like oh it looks like the sun's out i'm like you just shh okay it is actually really beautiful here today, but you can't. I'm stuck in a like cement block of the tuxedo cat, so it's like, yeah, yeah you can't so see the sun from anywhere here. So. You're in, you're in Radelaide. Radelaide. That's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's all right. The weather's nice. The weather's really nice. So, are, are you at the tuxedo cat, like, or that's just that your base at the moment, or that's where you could scramble some Wi-Fi? Yeah, yeah, that's where the Wi-Fi is, but also where all my shows are. So I just tend to come here during the days anyway, and just get on top of admin and do all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. So I've have I caught you? I've caught you in the middle of uh, your run. Yeah. Ah, uh, dude. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time, and I, I think it's actually a really cool time to to talk to you uh, about failure and comedy because I'm sure like uh, there's there's a little bit of that going on, and I'm I'm, I'm hoping like a lot of uh, non-failure. What's that? Success. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Basil. That's, that's really cool. nice. <laughs> how, how is it going? How is the, what's the show? Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, I'm working on a few shows. So yeah. I was working, Stuart Bowden's She Was Probably Not a Robot was the first one. Yeah. Um, and that went really well. And he just won the weekly theatre award here last night, which was cool. But he's gone. So I had to go and accept that. I hate doing that. Oh, it's no. really awkward. Everyone's like, who the fuck is this chick? <laughs> um, and I was like, I just want the champagne, man. Yeah. Just give me that. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that was really great. And now I'm working on Pat Birch's Overwhelmed, uh, which is uh, – do you know him, um, I Yeah, I feel, like, uh, I feel like I looked him up, but I haven't, I haven't seen him. Yeah, yeah. He's Canadian. Oh, um, so well. maybe you can catch him later in the year. Yeah. Actually, that would be mm. awesome. Yeah, yeah. But he's in Toronto and you're not, right? I'm in Toronto. It's where oh, I'm at. Yeah. Oh, right, right. I think I got mixed up as to – I don't know much about Canada. No, no, that's <laughs> I'm okay. Like, well, I don't know where that guy I mean, is. like, I studied in Ottawa and then, like, uh, I travelled yeah. to Montreal a lot. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's room for, for yeah. error. And then also I just think a lot of people um, uh, on the slopes and stuff as well. It's always like, you're Australian, yeah. oh, they're probably in Banff for something like that. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really cool, though. Um, so I'm working on Pat's show, and then I'm working on Trigvi's show, new show, Kraken, which is the follow-up to Squid Boy, which went oh gangbusters God. last year. Yeah. So this is like the difficult second album. Um, <laughs> yeah, the sophomore. Is, yeah, yeah, exactly, which is really fun to watch it develop yeah. because uh, he's kind of, yeah, he's taking a bit of a Dr. Brown approach and, and pretty much creating it on stage um, really? in front of audiences so yeah there is a lot of failure to be talked about in yeah. regards to that that's so cool though so how is it how has it been is it like uh is he still trying to work that out or is it something that he really enjoyed doing so he's like pushed out further no not at all i mean he squid boy was an amazing success but yeah. it took him about three three two years to make um and it's a, that slow process and because it's a sort of clown show i think often People who train at Golia, which is the big clown school that both Dr. Brown and Trigby studied at, sort of learn to find stuff in the shit. It's called being in the shit. So if you mm -hmm. get out on stage and you can't, find, you've got nothing, and the audience doesn't like you, where do you go from there? And how do you build something out of that? And how do you feel comfortable in that space that failed? Like, oh, this is the worst feeling ever. <laughs> These people want something, and I've got nothing to give. And I think. Yeah, these guys are trained to find some sort of solace in that space and some sort of creative energy from that feeling. Yeah. So, yeah, with Dr. Brown, he, I watched him build a show 
where he opened in Adelaide with not, no ideas. He set himself some challenges like um, no music, no talking, no props, no interacting with the audience, like no um, audience participation was the first thing he had. So he just gave oh himself God. boundaries um, and then came out and tried to build on that. And then he'd sort of shift the boundaries every day and he'd keep stuff that worked from the day before and just kind of build around that or he'd just throw away everything that worked the day before and try and find completely new stuff. And it was like an amazing thing to watch. Yeah. Um, this was two years ago when he was building the show that went on to win the Barry and the Foster's Edinburgh Comedy Award and the Total Theatre Award and got him, you know, TV work and all this stuff. Like it turned into a blistering show. But the first day I saw him get out on stage, he was like, it was painful and amazing oh, to watch yeah. um, and so bad, you know, like <laughs> so bad, but be beautiful and the best thing because yeah. it's so exciting to see somebody who's willing to fail hard, you know, yeah. you just don't see it that often. Do you feel less bad for him because you know what that's leading to or do you still get that human cringe that you're just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's still, it's always painful. Like, cause it's a genuine, it feels very genuine. Like failure is a much more genuine thing to witness than success on stage. I think like you can kind of, it is that, like you said, that human reaction of just like, oh, yeah. ow, God, that yeah. is so bad. I really, and I think when you're an empathetic person, it's a really hard thing to watch. Like you, you put yourself in that person's shoes and you're like, I can't imagine feeling the wave of disappointment that that guy must have just yeah. have felt you know, emanating from this audience who are expectant and have high hopes and you're just letting them down. Yeah, totally. Um, but, yeah, with him, you know, it's almost, the joke is almost, oh, my goodness, he's got a room of people watching him be this bad. Like there's a sort of meta joke where mm. if you're seeing a lot of work, you can sit in this room and just be like, this as a moment in time is a really funny thing. Even though the thing that's happening on stage is yeah. the furthest from funny it can be, yeah. do you think the fact that this hour exists in time is a genius joke? You know, that yeah. is a good joke. Yeah, totally. Uh, do you think that, like, uh, depending on the audience, like some people might think that he's failing, they just be like, I, I don't get it. Like, is this supposed to be funny? Yeah, I think... Th and. That's sort of how I think a lot of these comedians who play with the boundary there between, you know, this idea of anti-comedy, if it's even a genre or a thing that you can really talk about. But I think often that's where they find their gold is in playing that group of people in the audience off the group of people who want to get it and that mm -hmm. feeling of like... Yeah, definitely. Like, again, the first time I saw Phil, Dr. Brown, do a show, it was in Adelaide. It was in a tiny, like, 20-seat venue. There were eight of us in the room. Four of us on one side of the room were loving it and four of us, the other half of the audience, were absolutely hating it yeah. and heckling. And eventually he kicked out two of them. Two of them left. <laughs> but it was wow. he was really masterful at being able to play those two halves of the audience off each other. And then the four people who loved that show feel both superior to the four people who didn't because we got it, you know, yeah. in inverted commas. But also you feel like you witness something really unique and so you tell people. So I, I don't know, I feel like Sam Simmons has a similar appeal where he, you know, people, the fact that some people feel that they can't get it actually adds to the power of the thing for the people who feel like they do get it. Yeah. And whether any of these people get it or don't get it is kind of irrelevant. It's just a, it's a, it's a kind of issue of um, identity or identifying with a certain image of yourself as somebody who would get this kind of thing. Yeah. I think something really interesting in that. Because I, I do think it's kind of, uh, and it's kind of funny because uh, especially with comedy, you have people who are so successful and they're like, they're doing it for a living, they're traveling the world, and yet yeah, people are like, yeah, just don't find it. Like, I, I don't get it, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, you'd be hard pressed to find, um, I think, like a lot of other careers and jobs where someone's so successful and, and you can still be like, yeah, you know, like if someone's got a jet ski and stuff, you're like, wow, well, you know, I, I'm not, cause you are like, uh, you have a pool and that's really cool. Whereas if someone's got this empire and people come in and see them and people are laughing at them and you're like, 
yeah, no, <laughs> not, me, not for it. me. So with with Doctor Brown, like, um, was when you saw him and there was eight people there, um, and then when I saw him, it was a it was a packed theater and it was like the end of his run and he absolutely nailed it and I felt like I never felt so uncomfortable and yet like had <laughs> such a guttural laugh because it was it was it was mental. So I mean, there's a big. It's. I think there would be. A, I don't know what the time frame. Maybe that was like a year or so between those shows. Yeah. But yeah, and you've seen his progression. What? How? Yeah. How has he sort of changed in that time? Yeah, I mean, he like. I honestly didn't know anything about clown. The, the sort of philosophy of clown before I met Phil and started producing him, um, and I learned a lot through just watching him and watching the workshops that he runs. And really, that's the only. I don't really have any formal training or anything I haven't learned any of this stuff formally but now I spend a lot of time producing people who have studied clown um and I think it's such a lovely way of using failure as a doorway to success like they kind Mm of these guys are uh happy to fail and and I don't know it's it's a it's a hard thing to talk about but like I think if you're willing to fail like if the the lows that you are willing to go to in front of an audience are really low. It has the the sort of opposite effect also of the highs you can reach going up. It like right. broadens the field of what you are capable of doing because Absolutely. if you're somewhere in the middle and you're prepared to go down, like really fucking tank yeah. really hard, then it, there's also an implication that you are able to completely soar and really hit it. Yeah. at the other end of that spectrum, like the spectrum is, is broader. Totally. Um, and I think that's sort of what happened with Phil over that time was like he was and he struggled, like it was hard work making that show and he'd had a, you know, successful show the year before that people was, was kind of gaining momentum, people were excited about him. There's a lot of expectation which obviously is like the, you know, the enemy of mm-hmm. creativity. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. like as soon as you've got an expectant audience, you don't know what to give them. You don't know whether you should be giving them what you gave them last time, whether you want to change that, whether there's, you know, what, what it is that made them love you in the first place and whether that's something that you want to continue to pursue. There's all of these questions and he was like really struggling and it's the same thing I see happening with Trigvi now and pretty much anybody I know who's making a show um, for the second time particularly or the third time. Um, is this feeling of how do I go about doing this and not and when people expect you to be good uh, then am I allowed to be bad anymore do I have that as an option and I think people feel very constricted by uh, if they've had a successful product or show before then they don't feel necessarily like they are allowed to fail in the making of a new one which is really dangerous yeah Um, and I think that was what what eventually opened the door for Phil was just like, all right, I'm going to have to be really bad before I'm good again. And if people are willing to go there with me, then they're the kind of people who I'm willing to make work for and they're the kind of people who I would like to be my audience if um, if they're, you know, kind enough to indulge me while I make this thing, which at times is going to be not entertaining and not funny and not fun and, yeah, yeah in, in Phil's case, very uncomfortable for a yeah, lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is cool. And I think, like, again, Sam Simmons has managed to do a thing where he sort of weeds out the people. You weed out the people who aren't into you. With every show, you, a couple of people go away just hating it. Yeah. Um, but the people who love it will come back. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a good way of building. But, yeah, Phil, I mean, Phil was just, it was a slow thing. It was a year of trying and failing and trying and failing and slowly finding stuff that worked and, um not being precious and just kind of, yeah, getting on with it. And it's, yeah, it, it's a really nice way of working. It feels a little bit more honest. Yeah. I, I was going to say with that, like, um, especially going, if you compare like fringe shows and the comedy festival and, and I did that a while back and I looked at um, sort of the analytics of both festivals and, mm. and I was kind of arguing that, um, and I also looked at like the Melbourne Festival as well and just how much money was getting like pushed mm. into all these different things and um, you know that's a whole that's a whole different issue but I was kind of thinking like if you're and it comes back to that expectation thing too it's like if you pay five dollars for an act and uh, you like don't 
really get it. Oh, it's like another grade and it's at the start. You don't feel like you've been robbed of money. Whereas if you spend like $130 and go and see mm. one of these huge international acts and you're like, oh God, that was kind of crummy. Like, um, you know, that's that's the audience sort of perspective of like trying to get your mm. money's worth, I guess. But mm. then there's got to be the artist perspective too, where you're like, can I really afford to like not deliver something once you yeah. build up that expectation. Yeah, I think it's a really hard thing and as soon as money enters any discussion about art, it's a total game changer. You yeah. know, it changes your parameters so much. There's a um there's a comedian in Adelaide or performer called Steve Sheehan. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Okay. I think he's a complete genius. Yeah, I love right. him. But um he did a thing last year where he was doing a work in progress and for the ticketing structure he had I think on the opening day of the show it was $5 and the next day it was $6 and the next day it was $7. And so every day he was developing and every day it was increasing in, in you know, monetary value yeah. um, for the audience. And I really like that. That to me makes a lot of sense yeah. um, in a way. But then there's also something to be said for like you're getting an experience. If you buy a ticket, you're getting something. Like yeah. you might hate it but that maybe in hating it you'll find an opinion that you didn't know you had about what you expect theatre to be or, yeah. you know, there's, I think there's always value in seeing something that you hate. Like when I see things that I hate, it makes me realise the stuff that I love, you know. I'm like, oh, I hated that because he was a misogynist, yeah. you know. I hated and, and so that means therefore I value people who have like feminist ideals in their shows, like that as an example. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, I think... It is a tricky thing, though, like watching people develop work mm -hmm. in front of a live audience is like, okay, this audience is having to sit through stuff that is not polished yet. Is that fair? Like is it a selfish or an indulgent pursuit to be putting this, selling a ticket for this when it's not finished? Mm -hmm. Or are you giving people an opportunity into seeing you, your practice, like yeah. seeing how this stuff is made and seeing it at a stage where no one else will ever get to see it? Um, I kind of think that we hard. are in a stage, um, especially because like I like I look at a lot of things that I enjoy and that that my friends and stuff enjoy, and like I love behind the scenes of movies and stuff. You know what I mean? Mm. And and a lot of time that's you know compared to the the, the amazing final product, um, I still personally get so much more out of behind the scenes sometimes. Like even on a, like a really like. I mean, not a bad movie, but something I haven't enjoyed as much. If I get the opportunity yeah. to check out the behind the scenes and I can actually learn something. And I mean, that's a little bit different for me because that's sort of like an area that I enjoy and like making movies sure. and stuff. But I kind of think there is something cool and, and I'm always about the process as much as the, the finished product. And I think a lot of people are. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's an odd one. I think with the comedy festival and stuff, like a lot of comedians have um do they have like a couple i don't know what they call it but it's that sort of 10 days or two weeks um before the run where they're, they're trying yeah. out the the new show yeah it's yeah a little bit cheaper and then they go to the next level and yeah i don't know i think it's, it's just a it's a weird thing like money and art i don't know i've been thinking a lot about money and art <laughs> Yeah. I don't know how to how how those two things exist, especially in yeah. the fringe world. Yeah, because at some points, like in in sort of high art, you know, the ballet, the opera, or even like high pop art, like you go and see a Beyonce concert or, or yeah. whatever, it's an expensive thing, and it's associated with wealth, and it's also associated with taste, and there's something yes. to do with those associations which doesn't apply when you're when you're talking about emerging art or independent artists. There's something there where the emerging artist is associated with like poverty, the starving artist or yeah. a drifter or somebody who's sort of chasing a dream but one day they'll settle down and get a job as an accountant. Like yeah. there's, a, there's this weird thing and, and the transition between those two things, like how you go from being a fringe artist to a festival artist, for example, mm -hmm. where like if you were doing a show at the Melbourne Fringe and then you wanted to take it to the proper arts festival, how does that happen? Like where yeah. does this jump in price from $20 to $120 happen? Because these shows are not that different. Like the yeah. content is not that different. It's the interpretation and the context that they're sold in. They're sold in a certain way. 
they're associated with a certain kind of person. Like the audience wants, has a conception of who they are if they buy a ticket to this show. Again, it's like a very reflective thing, what you choose to invest your taste in. Um, so it, I don't know. I really don't know how to manage that as a producer of, of fringe work. It's like mm-hmm. society needs to value this work more because none of these emerging artists are making heaps of money mm-hmm. and they're working their asses off. They're doing yeah. everything, you know, um, and they're not getting paid anywhere near what their time is worth, mm-hmm. if, even if they're just getting paid $20 an hour for their day. Yeah. You know, they're not getting, they're not earning. Why is it that we can't, yeah, either charge more for this kind of work or why yeah. aren't more people interested in seeing this kind of work? Mm-hmm. Like can we either expand the audience or increase the value of that product? I don't know how and does that to do come, that. Do you think that does come back a little bit when you talk about audience is people not willing to take a chance. And I was talking about this with a friend um, earlier tonight and uh, talking about the whole Facebook world, right? And that it's, that you're not, people aren't publishing their failings and they're not publishing their shortcomings and stuff. And it's just like, hey, glorious, glorious, glorious. Like, this is great, this is great, this is great. And of course there are people that put shit content out there and it's just like cool peanut butter on toast. That's fantastic. But for the for the most part, it's just like a, a level upping, and people yeah. aren't willing to sort of be vulnerable and stuff. And and that's a massive part I've found of the fringe um, culture yeah. is that people are willing to be vulnerable and and take a chance. And the audience reflects that. Like the eight, like the, as you said, like you had the four and four, and like the four people that were willing to like give it a crack and actually enjoy it like mm. i'm gonna put money on it that they're you know you find that they are vulnerable people who are willing to take chances on people yeah. and experiences and hopefully themselves as well yeah i think so and i that's the ideal of the fringe you know world is that there is this audience that is supportive of risk and and of just of chance taking but then there's also and i think it does tie in with money a lot of pressure on an artist to be good like they want to be good they want to be polished and so like as a sort of antidote to that I run these variety shows which started a few years ago in Edinburgh and they were called Santoni and I was running them with Phil and um, Nick Sun, Pat Birch was there, um, John Conway, a whole lot of like alternative people Um, and they're basically a space where you can come and you can try something that is very likely to fail. Um, and so now I'm running them around the festivals as I go. We ran them in Perth and in we're running them in Adelaide as well. And I'll do some in Melbourne. And it's like a really interesting thing where you say to an artist, I'd like to book you, but I'd like you to bring something that isn't going to work. Yeah. And they don't, they don't know. They just don't. A lot of people are really? very suspicious of it. Um, but again, these shows, when they work, they are the best. Mm-hmm. Like they are mayhem, golden idiot like beautiful things and when they fail it is so painful it's like the worst it's a train wreck watching just person after person get up and try stuff that is just not working and it's I think it's so vital to carve out a space even in the fringe circuit which you would think would be the most accepting of that kind of work there's a lot of polish and there's a lot of sell 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 come this is my type five this is why you should come and buy a ticket to my show advertising kind of polished stuff and to carve out a space where people can come and be like this maybe does this is this a thing (laughs) i don't know i don't know no like it's so So is that what is that the the attractive part of it to you is that risk that it's like there might be like a lot of shit but somewhere there's going to be this massive nugget of gold and and we can all get (laughs) rich with happiness yeah. Sovereign yeah, it's exactly. the sovereign hill of comedy. Sovereign That's what it is. Hill. Exactly. Just sifting through shit, like absolute yeah. rancid shit and finding a nugget of yeah. gold in it. <laughs> yeah. There's some, I think so. For me, I get very bored with um, fourth wall theatre, for example, these mm-hmm. days. Like when I, the times when I'm most excited watching something are the times when I don't know what's about to happen. Like I can't predict it and mm-hmm. it takes me by surprise. Like the element of surprise and just the feeling of risk, like the, the ability to see in someone's eyes on stage that they do not know what they're doing or yeah. they are about to try something really stupid, that for me is the 
the most pure, beautiful moment in comedy. Like, yeah. Uh, and if and I do you, go, and do you I still sort of sorry. I was gonna say, do you still put that aside from from improv? Like, it's still a, a be different kettle of fish. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that much about improv to yeah. be honest. Like, it's it's in Australia those worlds are very discreet, like yeah. the improv world is very separate from the clown world, which is very separate from the comedy world, which is separate from the theatre world. There's not a lot of overlap, whereas I feel in the UK, uh, I was spending a bit of time there, there seems a bit not a, a bit more kind of overlap and a bit more cross-disciplinary mm. understanding of those mediums. Um, I think improv, again, is a similar thing. When it's, when it's bad, it's the worst thing you've ever seen, and when yeah. it's good, it's beautiful, you know, it's yeah. magical. Um, but you don't but have, I have, like, there's, much. I think there's... Um, the thing, like, you're not, if you go to a poly show, you, it's like, you're not going to be disappointed, but you might not like, you might be laughing for like a week afterwards from that <laughs> amazing thing. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's kind of like, what would you rather? And it's that yeah. risk not taken thing as well. And like, it's, it's funny cause it's like, it's like, that's comedy, but that's also life too as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like yeah. the, the coast and it's like, if you don't, if you don't take the massive risk, there's never going to be yeah. that massive Reward. Yeah, yeah, and I think with improv, uh, often the kind of improv that you see is a structured improv. You know, they have a structured game that they are improvising within, but they know the the structure. Like there's, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely, preordained there's definitely yeah, techniques and stuff, and and I, yeah. that's cool because like I only just sort of like dip my toes into the water, and I found that I was like, of course, there's, there'll be little tricks, but then. Um, the, the guy I was listening to talk about improv was saying that's what he wants to get away from. He's like, he, yeah. he doesn't even talk to the other people and they don't have sort of acts. They don't, they go, don't mm-hmm. sort of move from one thing to another mm-hmm. and they actually do come out blind on stage and, and sort of force themselves to, to screw it up. He's like, um, instead yeah. of being like, this is the setting and then working within like you said, the, mm-hmm. like I think you said boundary before, which is like the perfect thing. Like he, the funniest thing, he decided to be like Titan from the underworld and the other guy was in the <laughs> office. And so, cause they sort of, I don't know, whatever it was, it was like applying for something. And, and mm. the guy who was the traditional improv guy was just like, all right, like, um, I'll get on there and if you're the boss, I'll be the applicant and, and vice versa. And he got on there and he's like, oh, it looks like I'm the boss. And then the other guy's like, I'm actually Titan. And then like, <laughs> it was just, right. but like the goal that came from that, because no one had sort of messed around with that before. Like how many skits have you seen with, you know, yeah. someone coming from Atlantis or I don't know, I don't know my, I don't know my underwater <laughs> mythology, but you know what I mean? Get like, on your mythology, Basil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really exciting and I think there's definitely more to be found in that in that world and it, it sits very much at odds it feels with with theatre where mostly it's a written script that is then given to performers it's got a director it's very constructed and I mean that's that's a kind of for me I really value rigor in mm-hmm. work like so this is an interesting thing for me because I'm really fascinated by this mess of comedy that I love but at the same time, I don't like laziness. I really hate seeing someone be lazy on stage. So it's like a, I don't know, it's a fine line. It's like I want you to go out there confidently but willing to fail, but not just I can't think of anything to do, I can't be bothered making something. I want to experience yeah. this thing with these people in the room. And I think it, there is also something about acknowledging the people in the room, in the audience, like taking down the fourth wall and being like, all right, we're all in a room together. What can we do with this experience? What can we, what can we find in the potential of, of that? Yeah. Of that's itself. So that's so scary. Really like that's scary yeah. for audience members too. Yeah. Cause it's like yeah. Dr. Brown, like, like running out and like throwing people's stuff everywhere. And, mm-hmm. and like for me then, like my first thought was like, how does he not get sued? And that, that's coming <laughs> from like such a scared place being like, you yeah. can't, you can't do that. Like that's against the law to like grab someone's handbag. You know what I mean? It's such a, <laughs> like you, it, it is coming from such a scared place. And that's, I didn't even have to do anything. Like, it's just me sitting there being yeah. like, Oh, like I hope that's going to turn out. Okay. When, Kind of like, I guess what he's thinking is like, I, I hope it doesn't work out the way I, I planned. I hope she's not being yeah. going to be passive about it. That's going to lead to something cool. Yeah, yeah. And he has a lot of good ways of talking about it. Like he talks about a show like Invite 
people into his house and it is his house like it's his space he can do whatever mm. he wants in that space but there's like stuff upstairs like he's got a you know turtle in a tank that he wants to show the audience but you can't just like get someone in your house and then take them and show them the turtle you yeah. want to like offer them a cup of tea and make sure they're comfortable and maybe do the little tour and, and talk to them a bit and then be like hey do you want to come and see my turtle yeah. like and there's something about the way you have to manage your audience you have to have an empathy for that fear that you felt um, and, and sort of understand that feeling and be able to manage and sort of massage the audience into a point where they're um, complicit and they're interested and engaged and they want to come with you. You know, that yeah. you, I think often when you see new people in stand-up as well, they do that thing where they push, they're pushing ideas on people and there's this like forced eccentricity or this forced like wackiness that you see pe like particularly younger people just really... Uh, push without any list they're not listening enough to their audience and I think that's where the danger is mm -hmm. you know that but yeah I don't really know how that ties into failure no, but that's no, just that's a okay. no 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 I love it I really love it but I you did just remind me then because I was like oh crap we, we are off topic and that's absolutely okay <laughs> because there's no rules no one's getting arrested by the uh, the podcast police um, can you just tell me uh, about like how it how it sort of all started for you, little Mike Monroe. This is your life, but but um, you know, just go back as as far as uh, as you want. Like uh, uh, I don't want to I don't want to be like when what was the first joke you told because that's just terrible. <laughs> but and and not even like when did you know you wanted to because you 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 know a lot of people yeah. still don't know. It's still like up in the air. But yeah, yeah. yeah, just just take me back a little bit if you could. In comedy, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like when I was little, me and my brothers really loved watching like sketch shows, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, Fast Forward and um, Big Train and like Monty Python. All of that kind of stuff was like big in our family. But then I think I really started getting into it in uni when I directed the Monash Law Review, and then after that formed the sketch group Vigilante, uh, and we Ooh, did still got a still yes. got a pin. So Do you? Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's made so many pin. of those badges. Yeah. Holy shit. I've still got RSI from that fucking day. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so Vigilante Light was a couple of years and then I was working with one of the members of that, Vachel, for two, three years and we made a couple of shows and toured those around the circuit. And that's sort of where I got the most experience on circuit touring. Mm -hmm. um, and now he's doing like television stuff and other got other projects on the boil, wow, wow. Um, which is really exciting for him. And I am still on the circuit now with my new company, Don't Be Lonely, which is um, producing yeah five shows at the comedy festival this year. So like kind of Jeez. scaling it up and trying to work with more independent, emerging sort of alternative comics mostly, but sort of in the space between theater and comedy. Um, clown that weird space yeah. that doesn't really have a word at the moment <laughs> but hopefully the yeah. hopefully the I language remember, will go pick up i remember it was one of the funniest things uh that when i asked you to describe you were doing the show with vach uh it, not not angus was the the truth uh, truth how do i not that's crazy um <laughs> you only made a doco about i only it, made right? like a little video about it um <laughs> Uh, but I just, I just always laugh even when I watch it back. Is like, what are you? I'm like, so like, how how would you describe it? And like the way you describe me, like it's like we kind of do this. It's like dance comedy, and then it's like, and it was, and I was like this, just a mind f of of everything together. And then when I went and saw the show a number of times, like that's exactly what it is. But it's the coolest thing. But it, it was just like, okay, so. Uh, if you had like a label machine, there's no way you'd be able to do it and put it in like a little pigeonhole, you know, like it just, it wouldn't Yeah, work. It's, a, it's a tricky thing in the industry. I mean, in Edinburgh, there's a lot more uh, savvy kind of talk about how you can describe a show and you can have subcategories in the fringe guide. So you have like a right. theatre show with a subcategory of clown and a subcategory of music or you have a comedy show with a whatever, like you can have subcategories, whereas in Australia that doesn't really exist yet. Yeah. as a way of talking about work. So when like when I've been flyering this morning on Rundle Mall in Adelaide and you're trying to describe Trigvi's show Kraken, which is yeah. just like 
idiot experimental mime like you, yeah. that doesn't sound good yeah. Nobody wants yeah, to right. see it. like, that's exactly what you said like, last time you're like that doesn't sound good like no one's gonna go see that <laughs> Hey, do you want to come to a show that you might feel kind of awkward in and, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to put it out there. You're taking a big risk. Let's flip a coin and you might have a great time. You're like, you can't do that. It's like a marketer's worst nightmare. I know. I mean, with the variety of shows, I have started flyering it like that. I just say, hey, do you want to come and see an experimental variety show? It might be great. It might be fucking horrible. Get ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready. Swearing. Swearing. Um, yeah, but it's... It, that's the kind of audience you want. But there's yeah. also an, yeah, an audience who understands that concept. They're going to love the show, whether it's good or bad. They're mm-hmm. going to appreciate the show. But you want a broader audience than that. Too. Yeah, so that, yeah. that's where your problem is. Yeah, totally. And it's, it's, it's almost tricking, tricking people to come in. But like, I just think, it's, I think it, is, it is really cool. And, and like you said before, like, sometimes it is, a, it is about post-show. It's the, like that the debate that you have in the car, like driving home, because you're like, that wasn't that genius? And then your girlfriend's like, oh, like, you know, I just, I didn't really get it. And you're like, what are you talking about? It's, and it, I, that's that's the cool thing sometimes. It's just like, it, the show is so much bigger than the show. Like, uh, I love, yeah, I love that, that idea that, and I try and think about that when I'm producing shows, is the show, isn't just that one hour on stage. It's the show exists from the first time the audience member hears about it to the moment they forget it. That's the show. So it's like managing every single moment of that journey through hearing about the show, hearing about the show again, deciding to buy a ticket to that show, seeing the mm-hmm. poster of that show, lining up to get into the venue to see that show, leaving the show, having that conversation, having a conversation with someone else who hated the show. Like all of that is part of the show. And mm-hmm. you can only manage it so much. Like it's a, yeah. you know, it's a wild animal that itself has the ability to fly or fail given the kind of mood that those audience members are in on that day or you you know there's so many other factors to a show that aren't what you can control particularly I was gonna say um that when I was filming Truth and because I saw I saw it uh I filmed rehearsals and then I saw it Mm. a couple of times and uh I, f- I saw it, I'm pretty sure I saw it like two nights in a row and it was just the craziest thing. No, so I didn't see it two nights in a row, but I'd watched the rehearsals um, while yeah. I was editing during the day. And then I went and saw the show at night and I took my sister and it was so cool to have like her perspective on it as well. Yeah. Um, but just jokes that killed the first night just didn't like I was I laughed because I knew the bit was coming I was like yeah and then I was like what are you guys doing this is hilarious but then the opposite happened too like um yeah stuff that you know that you, that you hung on to um just just absolutely killed one night compared to the next how do you um as a comedian decide like is there is there like a threshold you're like I'm gonna do this like uh, and I'm and I'm talking now about like making a show, not just like yeah. um, the the random random nights. Like, how do you uh, decide? Like, do you have a? Is it just a, is it a gut feeling, or is it like okay, I'm gi- I've given this like three three <laughs> times, or is it like yellow card, red card, like soccer, <laughs> like you got a warning, I like buddy? Yellow card, red card. S- step it up. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Or like, I don't know what the, yeah. li- like the lifeguards do, but you know, like naughty kids at the pool, <laughs> how they're like, buddy, blow my whistle, hey, yeah. <laughs> hey. And then the second time, the second time they blow their whistle, and the third time they get off the thing and they come over and they're like, I don't want to kick you out, but I might have to, you know? And then, the, and then it's the final time they go and get the supervisor and you're out of there. <laughs> having milky bars from the outside. Not that I've been there. <laughs> It's a very detailed uh, description of something yeah. that's never it's, happened to you. No, no, I know. Right. <laughs> uh, so, what, what's your what's your system? Yeah, Is I don't there know. A I think I think when when I'm making shows, and I always work collaboratively because I don't perform. So, like when I was working with Vach or Vigilante Hope guys, or when I'm working with Trig V or any of these people I'm working with now, um, it's often it's the thing that makes you both laugh is the yeah. first thing that gets a vote in. You're like, huh, that's funny. And you're both like, yeah, there's something in that that's funny. And so that goes in. Um, and then it's honestly, I, I see jokes die a lot over time and it's just a staleness 
thing. And nice. because I'm often watching and teching from the back, I can I see the show again and again. And the performer can't necessarily see that the inflection of their voice plus the direction they were looking plus the scene that they chose to do just before the moment they made that comment like all of the, the tiny minutia of like body mm. language or the heat of the room like there's all of these kind of things which can really take a joke from being funny to not funny mm -hmm. but then there's also it's not just that it's an audience thing and it's a you can like it's a funny thing you can tell when you're going to have a bad audience or not I don't want to say bad audience that doesn't sound nice but you might have a not, not a very yeah, yeah, yeah. A not a non-responsive non-vocal mm -hmm. audience from the very start before you've done anything on stage you can tell when that audience is walking in they're quiet they've got their arms closed they've got they're in a closed like body position mm -hmm. if the music is too soft often that will like affect the the how loud they're likely to be so like house music how bright it is whether the lights go down before the show starts and come up again so whether they have a clarity on whether the show started or not there's all of these tiny little things that make an audience um react in a different way to whatever you're likely to do um so you can't manage if people have had, you know, an audience is maybe 100 people who've each had the day that they've had following the lives that they've had. Mm -hmm. They're with the person that they're with. They're, they have a certain expectation of the show given what they've heard about it or what they haven't heard about it. Whatever it is, like there's so much there that you can't address with your show. Like your mm -hmm. show just cannot possibly account for all of those experiences. So you've just got to, I mean, I think the problem is when people start pandering to broad audiences with their material so keeping the jokes that work and sieving out the ones that don't always fly that have like a 50 percent strike rate you're making work that is then not very interesting like mm -hmm. you're becoming a comedian who is palatable and entertaining and mm -hmm. totally fine <laughs> yeah. like go yeah, you can go and get a job at commercial radio then that's yeah. fine yeah, yeah you yeah. are done you're doing just good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it needs so, a little but, pat as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think with us or the, with the people I like to work with, they're more interested in challenging themselves and their audience. themselves, yeah. Is so, it hard then when, when you're starting out and I'm guessing that, you know, you might have struggled with it at the start or, um, you know, shows that you're directing, like, does that is it hard to be like, it's okay, like it wasn't you? Because I'm sure you take it very personally when you're first starting out. It's like, ah, oh, God, I didn't get it. I was shit, you know, and be like, it's it's cool. It's like you actually didn't do a bad job. And is it yeah. is that certain, certain level of, of confidence that you need or to do it enough times to be like, you know what, that wasn't the worst. They just, they didn't get it. They didn't love it from the start, um, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think you've got you. It's a really fine line because you have to be responsive to your audience. There's no point in doing something that your audience hates, like, yeah. and because you're not you're not going to enjoy that either, unless you're in deliberately managing them into a place where they really hate you for a point. So you you know you manipulate them into a place where they hate you, and then you manipulate them back into loving you again, or whatever. If you're interested in pushing and pulling your audience away, mm -hmm. maybe that that's something you want to do. But at the same time, you want to be, yeah, you want to have empathy and humility on stage, and you want to, you know, the, what's the point? Like if you're going to be up there just antagonizing people, mm -hmm. you can do any old job. Go and work in a bank. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> You know, uh, if that's denied, what you're denied. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, there's other ways of expressing that. that uh, um, no one, they don't still use stamps anymore, I don't think. I think that's uh, the, the past. Yeah. But uh, two things on that. I heard a, a comedian say just to do the push pull thing because he really, uh, he was, he was um, developing this bit over the course um, of a festival and he was saying that his, the bit was like, Breaking Bad is the worst show in the world it's like the most yeah. overhyped thing and then just that gap of like every yeah. single person in the audience hating him and he's like mm. every night that gap gets a little bit longer i like i want to see like how far i can push that and then and then he brings him back and then the other thing i was going to say is just like surely because there's these people in life but there's got to be the, these types of comedians too who are like 
they just hate the audience. They hate the audience because they're like, you guys aren't getting it. Guys are too stupid. Like, this shit is awesome. Like, I know this kills. Like, as you're saying, like, it's a fine line, right? Because you're, it's like, no, they're not getting it. Like, you should be smart enough to know that. Um, yeah. But then showing weakness is often, like, death. You yeah. know, you, it, so it is, you can see how it's a really hard thing for a comedian to stand in front of an audience and be both responsive and reflexive to their desires, but also still telling them what they want to tell them, like, you know, still doing the thing that they believe in um, with confidence. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, it's a really fine line. And I think there's, you see people falling off that all the time and trying to manage that push and pull all the time. And I think a good comedian is somebody who can do both of those things, like work between crowd work and their own material seamlessly, work between um, acknowledging failure or bluffing and pushing through. Like all of these are tactics that can work if you use them well. Both of those things will work. Sometimes if you go, oh, that, that joke didn't work very well, mm -hmm. an audience loves you for that. They go, yeah. oh, he, get, he knows that he's not yeah. being good. It's okay. He's on he's our side. He's trying something new. Yeah. 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 But then sometimes the, if you try that approach and, and acknowledge weakness or acknowledge failure, the audience is like, even this guy knows his shit. Why right. are we here? <laughs> like, right, and it's, right. it's, you know, it's about picking, really being able to understand what your audience, where your audience is in relation to where you are and trying to align that as much as possible. And it's a, like I have so much respect for people who are able to do it, yeah. who are able to communicate because it's like a really finessed model of communication, stand-up yeah. particularly. Like I'm, I'm only starting to learn a bit more about stand-up and I'm starting to see a bit more. I'm by no means a you know a expert on that stuff. But I think there's just somebody who can use a microphone only to convey not only ideas but kind of relationships with a massive group of people. That's a really it's, hard thing to do. It's crazy. I, I kind of think like comedy would be hard enough just getting like – the the green light red light sort of thing for like funny or not funny I mean it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's it was not that it's not that black and white or green and red yeah, but yeah. the the fact also that you can you can heckle it's just like imagine if you heckled people in their job like in their day to day life <laughs> like that bank teller you know like imagine yeah. if you heckled from the back of the line being like buddy and I'm sure people do but it's just it's <laughs> it's like a comedy show it's like ah oh, that's a heckler it's got a name like yeah. it's, it's not it's not a dick at the back or you know like, a, like <laughs> yeah. a drunk lady it's it's called like it's called a heckler they're a person it's a known thing and comedians yeah. have to deal with that but it's like in real life it's just like oh, i got made to feel shitty today like <laughs> someone gave me crap because i made a mistake uh, in like bringing their food and then like you're the worst person ever you know what i mean like in real life they're just a dick but it's kind of not <laughs> yeah. it's kind of not acceptable it's just like yeah that's that's not really it's not really cool but then uh yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. Do you think it do you think it is more accepted in in comedy like it, like it is like it's it's going to happen. It's not like people get uh I guess sorry, people do get thrown out, but like just for the the you have yeah, that ability to 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 not give them is. the laugh or you also mm. have the ability to be like you suck. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, luckily, the work that I've made generally doesn't incite hecklers. I was going to um, say, generally it's... doesn't suck, too. That, that also helps. <laughs> well, it probably helps. But, like, uh, the yeah, I mean, if there's an element of theatricality, people are generally scared in scared of heckling. They feel like mm -hmm. it's not... It's funny, so I don't know where that divide is, like where the line is in the sand. But definitely Pat Bircher, who I'm working with now, um, tends to incite hecklers and he is amazing at mm -hmm. slamming them. Like he That's so cool. really, it's a beautiful thing to watch because he's just like, I'm up here chasing my dream. Like, yeah. and just sort of plays <laughs> into them for attacking him while he's chasing his beautiful dream. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, but I don't know where... Yeah, because part of me is like, heckling, I hate hecklers. Mm -hmm. This is not why you're here. Yeah. Why, how dare you feel like you can interrupt this thing? You've paid to come and see somebody yeah. entertain you and now you're here interrupting them and stopping them from being able to entertain you. But at the other half of that, if you're sort of putting a, a clown lens over it, you are just people in a room. Like one of those people has a microphone but there's all these other people who've got ideas and things to say and is it fair to deny them the ability to do that like mm -hmm. is it 
you know, I don't know. I don't know philosophically where I sit on that issue. I mean, I don't like people being dicks, mm-hmm. obviously. But then, I mean, there's also the other way of sort of, I guess, crowd work or in clowns and audience participation is like a way of acknowledging an audience and and inviting them into the conversation mm-hmm. rather than them like interrupting you while you're at the always at the worst point where they're going to like derail a punchline yeah. always every time uh, they manage yeah, to do yeah. that um <laughs> it, yeah i don't know if there's a, a more sort of a kind of listening way of of making that interaction all right i don't know i don't know where i sit on that no, that's i should okay. think about hecklers yeah yeah <laughs> um i was just gonna say and i, I want to wrap up because i know that you're, you're a busy mm. lady and uh you will have a bazillion things to do. But in terms of failure in comedy, do you do you find that's affected the way you look at, at trying new things in, in life? Like, is it stuff that, that you learn on stage that you just like, this is actually a life goal. This is what, uh, sorry, not a life goal. This is like a life lesson that, uh, mm. that I've just been taught here. Yeah, I mean, I think you are often rewarded for risk taking. I think that's mm-hmm. the sort of thing I've learned. And it's like... I also think this has been become my my new sort of mantra is it'll be okay, it's only art. It's like there's no <laughs> lives at stake. And it's the same, yeah. you know, like the, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? Like you're going to go out in front of an audience, you're going to try something, that 20 people is going to think you're a dick or they're going to think mm-hmm. you've failed or they're going to think you're not good. What does that actually matter? Yeah. Does that matter? Like no. is that going to affect you tomorrow? If you don't dwell on that. Mm-hmm. And if you learn something, you're like, oh, people don't like it when I, you know, throw carrots at them. Whatever it is you've chosen to do that hasn't worked. Like, Why I don't know. Why do they like me? <laughs> Come on, I'm really throwing these carrots. Take the goddamn carrots. And then you're calling them like uh, Santa's uh, reindeer's names and stuff. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was great, but uh, it didn't fly. It didn't fly. Really it didn't fly. But, yeah, I think that's the main thing is just like the the more you watch this stuff, uh, the more you're just like, oh, yeah, of course it doesn't matter. And it yeah. doesn't matter. You know, like, just take a risk. Like, why – if 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 you're not going to die, if people aren't going to die or be really hurt by what you're about to, to do, mm-hmm. then just, like, give it a go because it might soar. <laughs> you need, you, you, need, know? you need a checklist, two boxes. <laughs> yeah. Are people going to die? And nope. it's like, um, <laughs> no, right? That would be so awesome. And you, once you yeah. tick, once you tick the two boxes, then then you proceed, and you just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. scrumple that piece of paper and throw it at someone. You're yeah, like, yeah, oh, this, this gag still isn't working. <laughs> God damn it! God damn it! Ah, uh, that's yeah, cool. So- thanks, thanks, Miss Dell. I think like uh, the, obviously, uh, I I had a billion questions written down and didn't look at them once because <laughs> that's what good conversations and interviews are about. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to pull it up. I don't, I don't even care. I think that was was that that was <laughs> okay. awesome. Did you want to say anything else about like mm-hmm. when I first got in contact you, with you uh, about comedy and failure? Were you like, that makes sense? Yeah, I think that's like there's something very um, – those two things are very linked, I think. There's something about them. And, I mean, it's even like, you know, the fine line between comedy and tragedy is the sort of same as the fine line between success and failure. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's parallels there. Um, and I think the people who are more interested or l- less fearful of exploring failure are more likely to experience success, really. I, I mean, in my experience. Yeah. And, and Often that seems to be the case. But, you know, uh, I don't know. There's also something to be said for people who are sensible. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I got mixed messages here. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm going to try and get this up straight away so that people can and can check it out and then I can send it to my friends in Adelaide. Um, so do you, do you want to let's, – let's plug some stuff with the remainder uh, of the time. Yeah. Uh, plug. <laughs> Plug, Wait, plug, plug. what's what's the sound of a plug? That's a plug getting pulled out, but we want to put a plug in. <laughs> it's like a squeak, yeah, isn't it? Weird. Bath plug. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, my bathtub is filthy. Yeah, it's it's from disgusting. the 1800s. Clean. 
Um, yeah, so I'm working on a f- couple of shows. I'm working on Pat Birch's Overwhelmed, which yeah. is on at 9.45 at the Taxido Cat uh, until the end of the festival. And I'm also working on Trig V Wakenshaw's Kraken, uh, which is on until the end of the festival at the same time, unfortunately. So you can't see them both uh, on the same night. Uh, 9.45 at the Taxido Cat. Yeah, I know. Um, Annoying. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm also running these these stupid variety shows called Something Stupid at the Cat, which are free on Fridays and Saturdays at 11.30, which Sick. are just mental. Uh, and Perfect Squid Boy, to it's go not... mental, though, P.S. 11.30. Yeah, yeah, totally. Why not? Uh, is you not going to get any better from that point on? Probably not. <laughs> no. So we can watch someone else fail. Uh, yeah, and then Squid Boy is on tonight, tomorrow, and the following night. Um, it's mostly sold out. There's a few tickets left. And generally, like, I think people should come and hang out at the Tuxedo Cat because the Tuxedo Cat's got really good risky programming and I think that's another element of, you know, where, where failure can be kind of inserted into the industry is people taking a risk on what they program, like venues actually not just booking acts on what they think they can make money off but booking acts on the sort of artistic integrity of the work or the potential that that work has or, you know, how interesting it is. So yeah. I think hopefully the industry can kind of... You know, it's just because there's no money around, basically. Venues mm-hmm. don't have any money. You know, nobody's got any money for this stuff. But if people can be a little bit more risky with yeah. what they choose to invest in, I think audiences, venues, artists, everyone, take a bit more, take more risks. Take more risks. Take yeah. more risks. That's just it. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah, Nike I wish you were right. in guys. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be coming and supporting oh. all these weirdos. Yeah, totally. I love, <laughs> I love the weirdos. It's, the Fringe is so cool. And I am actually disappointed because for some kind of, well, not for some unknown reason, but for some really weird reason, I just happened to be in Australia for like the last couple of Fringe festivals in, in a row. And then my really good friend who um, is involved in like comedy trivia. Um, mm-hmm. and But then, so sorry, he does like trivia at, comedy venues and stuff and so it's, it's just mm-hmm. all a really, like a really nice mix and so um yeah the last few years I've got across and it's it's kind of bizarre like even though I was like overseas like right up until yeah uh, right. like February like I, I was back and I was like oh I never thought I would like be able to <laughs> you know come straight back and it was a really cool place to go into like especially after traveling and you said like wild and free and like willing to talk to anyone and then all of a sudden you get, get to Adelaide and, and it's filled with crazy people and <laughs> and, and I was lucky enough to go to get like uh, uh, an artist pass. I was able to swindle one of those yeah. for a couple of days while I was in town and, and got to go talk to everyone. And that's a whole nother uh, level yeah. as well. Like it's it's so cool to see a show that's like crazy, but then it's kind of awesome to talk uh, talk to the the uh, the artist afterwards and be like, what? Are yeah, you, like totally. that was crazy. Like what about that? And like oh my god. Or the other way where it's like. <laughs> Let's let's buy a beer. Like I can see that you're that you're down. It's okay. It's like uh, <laughs> yeah, more yeah, than yeah. four people will show up tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll call <laughs> yeah, my yeah, mum. Yeah. That was a real yeah. stinker, but I don't hate you. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> uh, all right, cool, dude. Good luck uh, with the rest of it, and uh, I'll be in Thank touch you. and at putting this thing up and and getting it out awesome. there. Awesome. Yeah, cool. It was really nice to chat to you, man. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Thank you, dude. You too. You're uh, the best. I'll speak to you soon. I'll speak to you soon, dude. Keep it real. Keep it real. Bye. Bye.